Uh, good afternoon and welcome to our January webinar, a collaborative presentation of the Federation for Children with Special Needs and the Recruitment Training and Support Center. My name is Janie Krekko and I am the Training and Support Specialist at the RTSC. Today's webinar is the Teenage Brain and the Juvenile Justice Reform in Massachusetts. Our speaker is Lindsay Heffernan, who is the director of the JDAI, which is the Juvenile Detention Alternative Initiative. Um, welcome, Lindsay. Glad you made it. <laughs> thank you very much for having me. It's really wonderful to be here again and to talk about the important work that we're doing. So thank you for the opportunity. I do want to um, stress again that um, Lindsay is the head of the um, part of the Juvenile Just Detention Alternative Initiative that is looking towards um, reforming the system. And you just um, received a very large grant, which we're very proud of you for, um, you. to make that happen. Yeah, okay. we just re received a $900,000 grant um, come over the next three years in order to um, build up more staff capacity to figure out how do we fix some of the challenges that we're facing every day in Massachusetts in the justice system. So thank you very much. It's okay. exciting, exciting expansion for us. <laughs> Uh, so would it make, should we get going? We should get going. Wonderful. Yep. So, yep. so uh, again, I'm happy to be here. My name is Lindsay Heffernan. I work for the Department of Youth Services um, in Massachusetts, and my role is as the state coordinator of the Juvenile Detention Alternative Initiative. I'll spend a lot more time talking about what that is today, um, but a little bit of my background. Um, I was a former uh, high school teacher, actually, um, uh, very briefly, and a counselor for adolescent girls before going to law school and becoming a juvenile public defender. So I represented kids in Massachusetts in the juvenile court for many, many years before moving into this role, thinking about how do we make our system better? Uh, what, are, what are the steps that we need to take? So it's wonderful to be here again with you. So I think Maybe a little technical assistance just to help me move the slide forward. I was working a minute ago. Can we get stuck here? <laughs> there we go. Okay. Is it sure? should do it yet. Okay. Perfect. There we go. There we go. Okay. All right. Uh, so. I often joke that the teenage brain, uh, what is it and what on earth is going on in there? Uh, this cartoon, um, obviously meant to be humorous, but has some, some really actually important things. The more we learn about the, what's going on inside kids' heads, right? The rebellion center and the super, super turbo rebellion center and the center of the universe center. Right? <laughs> Teenagers are, are in a state of flux and have an awful lot of things going on. You'll notice them. A really small little point way off on, on the side is the peer pressure resistance. We'll spend a little bit of time talking about what does the science tell us about peers and, and teens. Um, and uh, while, this, while this is certainly meant to, meant to be humorous, we've learned a lot about the teenage brain over the last 20 or 30 years. And part of my role is to figure out how do we take that science and put it into practice when we think about our everyday interactions in the juvenile courts uh, across Massachusetts. So as many of you probably know, the, um, during the teenage years, kids go through, their brains go through a, a massive stage of growth. And really it's one of the three times in their lives where they go through this. So we think about um, babies in the womb, right? Uh, that, that there's a lot going on just as the brain develops. It's sort of the first major, major stage of brain development. And then in the first two years of life, when you think about toddlers and they're learning to walk and to talk and to eat and to sleep, <laughs> that actually takes a lot of brain development. So lots happening during those two stages of, stages of life. And then the next and really final stage of, of development of the human brain is in the adolescent years, um, starting really in er early puberty, so we think about 11 or 12 and running right, right on through. The amazing thing that we have now learned uh, is that we scientists would, would say that brain development is continuing at least until 25, and now actually some researchers are even saying as late as 30. Um, so when, when kids go off to college and then they come home, I say that's all good. They're not done yet. They still just needed some, some more time to, to really fully develop. So the idea that brain development takes this long, I think what's important to know is that it is not a linear process, right? The slide shows um, that the, the brain, we get more and more purple or blue, so more brain development uh, through time, but it is not as if we took a 
five-year-old brain and a 10-year-old brain and a 15 and a 20-year-old brain that each year it's getting bigger. That's not really what's happening. In fact, what's going on in adolescence is a real transformation in how the neurons are wired and how information processes through the brain. Um, and my hope today is not to turn everybody into neuroscientists, but to understand some of the really important basics which can explain how adolescents behave and some of the real challenges that we see that can arise during adolescence. So that brain development, what happens is it goes on in stages and it's really different parts of the brain develop at different points in time. Um, and we're now learning more and more every day about what does that mean then for the young people that we care about uh, and, and behaviors that we might see them having. Um, since the brain doesn't develop in, in perfect order, what I, what I like to think about is there's really a war in the brain about which part of the brain is gonna kind of control that's happening in, in adolescence. The first part of the brain that really develops um, or goes through this stage of, of redevelopment, I guess is more appropriate to say, is the limbic system. So the limbic system is the part of the brain that controls um, your fight, flight, fear, right? That survival mechanism. It makes sense it's the first part of the brain to develop because it's what keeps us alive, right? Uh, as, as, as humans, evolutionarily speaking. Um, and so that part of the brain, um, um, limbic system centered in the amygdala, I like to say you can take your hand and if you make a fist and you put your thumb in the middle, that this is really the brain, right? A really simple crude model. Your limbic system is the thumb that's in the middle, right? Really deep in the brain and your knuckles would be the, the frontal cortex, which is the second most important really part for us for today. Uh, and that's really behind the, eye, behind the eyeballs. Um, that though that limbic system, not only does it control your survival system, but it also controls the part of you that is um, seeking reward, seeking um, sensation, seeking um, a lust in life, right? The part that makes a 13 year old wanna jump off a bridge. Why? That's the part of the brain that's the limbic system, right? So it's designed to keep us alive, but also makes us want to be attracted to things that are often really risky, but for which we might get a big reward, right? It might feel really good. So jumping off a bridge to an adult doesn't seem like a lot of fun. To a 13, 14 year old kid, jumping off a bridge comes with a really big high in euphoria. Um, so does, unfortunately, drugs, um, and so do peers, and so do some other things that can be more negative. But this, during this time of development, um, we're, we see kids being pushed into um, more and more risky things. What's a challenge for us is that development really begins in early puberty. Um, so what we say is somewhere around, obviously different for every person, somewhere between 11, 12, or 13, we start to see that, and that's when parents would report crazy antics that their kids will be going through and, um, uh, and a complete inability to answer the question of why. Why would they do those things? It's the limbic system that's driving some of those behaviors. So it's driving cars fast. For girls, it's stealing and shoplifting. <laughs> um, things that feel good in the moment um, and, and, and come with a reward. The part of the brain that we really need as adults um, to function and to make good long-term decisions, unfortunately, doesn't really begin development until later on um, in adolescence, somewhere around 16, 15, 16, um, and continues right on up until at least 25 or 30. And that's that, that's, those are your knuckles, right? That's your frontal cortex right here behind, behind your forehead. And that's, this is the part that in many ways I think makes us most human. Uh, it's what it's what distinguishes us from from the apes, so to speak, right? Our ability to think in the abstract, to think long term, um, to weigh pros and cons. Um, that's real adult mature behavior and teenagers just don't have that capacity um, as being very well formed, right? They had a frontal lobe before, uh, before puberty. It just wasn't working very well <laughs> and it doesn't really start to work well until later on in adolescence. So when you think about a kid who, for whom a freshman in high school, let's say, and a parent is trying to encourage them to do well in school because college is coming. For a teenager, college and the future long-term consequences of years out, they're maybe thinking about Friday <laughs> night and what's happening. They can't really go to, to, that, to that place. Their brains really won't let them think about it. Or for a parent who says, or ways that things that I used to say as a public defender, I'd represent a child in the court system. And as a young public defender, I wanted kids to understand their decisions and to think through them and to be with me and as part of my representation. So we'd sit down and I'd try to do what 
feels normal as an adult if we had an important decision to make that happens every day in the juvenile courts. Um, we'd make a pro and con list. I'd try this exercise with kids. And I now know they just really weren't developmentally ready to do that because you can make a pro and con list with the kids, but they can't really um, navigate weighing, weighing those issues. So we could make a, a pro and con list that would be very obvious to me as adult with lots of cons, good, many reasons not to make this decision, and one or two pros. And teenagers will say over and over again, yeah, they'll look at that list and go, but that's not going to happen to me, right? That's not me. Um, that doesn't feel right to them. That logical weighing is, is not something that they're very good at. So what does that mean? We have a limbic system saying do risky things and a frontal cortex that's not very well developed until later adolescent that's going to help them think through risky decisions, right, and make, and make better decisions. That gap is where we have problems, right, and where kids need, what I would say, even more protection and support to get them through those, those critical years. Um, the way the way that the researchers talk about about this, there's a couple couple quotes on the screen for you, right? We we talk about it as a temporal gap, right? And it, this this gap in time where kids are prone to make risky decisions that aren't part of their long-term development. They aren't. That's not who they're going to be as adults. Um, but they don't really have the capacity to to weigh all of that. The National Research Council um, has talked about, which is a, a body of national experts that con convened only um, by the U.S. government um, uh, on issues of importance. They convened years ago to look at, about 2014, to look at juvenile the juvenile justice system and what should our juvenile justice system be doing. So they had the neurologists and the psychologists and the psychiatrists all come together to think about the juvenile justice system and what's what's critical and what's different about adolescents. And there were three pieces that they pulled out and I imagine if people reflect on teenagers they know these really will resonate. They lack mature capacity for self-regulation particularly in emotional situations. Right? Things are emotional. This is when we really see kids not being able to make good decisions independent of that emotion. They can't sort of pull that away. Um, and emotion for kids is different than emotion for adults. So just the presence of peers alone, we know drives up emotions for, for young people. They also have a heightened sensitivity to external influences such as peer pressure and immediate incentives. And so that which is right in front of them um, and which is going to, which is sort of outside of them, their peers, their communities, their surroundings, that those are going to influence decisions much more than it would for an adult. For an adult, as, a, as an adult woman, if my friends of other adult women were around me, that really wouldn't change how I make decisions. For a, for a young person, uh, 14, 15, 16, putting them in the presence of their peers is going to completely change a lot of how they see themselves in the world and the decisions they're going to make. And then the third really important distinction, which we just talked about, they show less ability to make judgments and decisions that require future orientation. That is, they can't think about the future because the future for them, as we said, maybe is Friday. <laughs> it's not long term. So when we think about a justice system that has often used harsh consequences for kids for bad decisions or long consequences. So thing like long prison terms for, for young people's and their their behavior. The idea there, why why do we do that? What what was the thought that's the policy behind that is we think long consequences will help people think I shouldn't engage in a bad behavior, right? If I'm gonna go to jail for ten years. For young people that doesn't even factor in. They're not there. They can't even Im they can't imagine what ten years is or look or looks like. But it also doesn't impact their decision making in the way that it would for adults. So what I often say to people is, Have you ever asked a teenager why they did something, something ridiculous? Why I had this experience frequently as a public defender. Why did you take a baseball bat to the mailboxes again? Why did you punch your best friend during lunch, right? Why did you hit your mother and now you want to go home? Why, why, why? And the answer I always get, very unsatisfactory. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. And the more we know about brain science, the more we know they really don't know, right? They're not being smug and standoffish or flip. They don't know. They weren't thinking in the way that um, adults would think through decisions and then make a, make a rational choice. Uh, so we know this kid, this picture shows a kid on a skateboard standing at the top of some high ledge. Why? I don't know. He doesn't know either. Uh, but it feels good and that's why he's going he's gonna to engage in that activity. So 
this is how a typical teenage brain develops, right? Teenage brains, healthy and normal teenage brains are going through this where they're, um, it's a time in adolescence where we're challenging authority, um, that's natural and that's normal, we're trying risky things, and our brain over time is learning some of these ideas are not good ideas and it's gonna come back and so wait, wait, let's put on the brake, right? So that, that limbic system is the gas and the brake of the frontal lobe doesn't come along until later. So while they're going through all of that as, as normal, we know most teens, somewhere between 90 and 95% of them, engage in delinquency. Um, so I always encourage people, think back on yourself at 14 or 15 and the decisions that you made um, and all of the decisions that you made which probably were criminal um, and that's hard sometimes for people to swallow, but engaged in shoplifting. We were at the parks late when we weren't. We were closed. We went to a party and drank alcohol. We, you know, we, we tell kids not to do all of the things that we probably did ourselves. Um, and that's okay, but to just be honest with, we know that's normal. For the kids who come into the justice system, unfortunately, um, we know though that they have experienced very high rates of trauma. And so they haven't gone through normal development to begin with. And so I'd like to just spend a few minutes to talk about what do I mean when I, when I say trauma and then how do we know it's impacting how adolescents are thinking, if, it, if at all, what's, what's going on in their brains. When I say trauma, I mean either a single event or a repeated chronic um, distressful situation that overwhelms your ability to cope um, and when you cannot cope it, it makes sense then that our survival mechanisms kick in right if i can't cope and i don't feel safe and i don't feel okay it's my survival mechanism we already talked about that system that's your limbic system it's going to start driving your activities so think about you know the the early humans who lived in the caves and the lions are coming right it's the limbic system that's keeping you alive fight flight freeze um, what happens then if you, ever, if you are a young person and you're experiencing some sort of traumatic incident or you fear you are about to experience some sort of traumatic incident, biologically what happens is that limbic system kicks into gear and actually floods the brain with hormones. Um, norepinephrine is one of them. People often have heard of adrenaline or cortisol. Um, and that causes a whole bunch of different things to happen in the brain without conscious thought, uh, but that, that are really important. So I like to think about when, um, what happens when you, um, in your body, if you are driving down the highway and you think a Mack truck is about to run you off the road. You're convinced they don't see you, you're in the blind spot, it's moving over and you think, I'm gonna crash. Um, what actually happens in your body? If we were all in the room together, I'd ask you to shout out ideas, but some of the things people will say are, um, I suck in my breath. <gasps> Yep, you do. Biologically, your body is taking in oxygen. It's getting ready to move. People will say, I start to sweat. You do. You start to sweat because your body is getting ready to cool itself in case it has to run, right? If you've got a flight, we're going to have to use that one. We're going to need to be ready to, ready to move. Um, your heart starts to pump. People will say sometimes it feels like it's beating out of your chest. And what is going on there? Same thing, your body is getting ready to push blood out to all of your limbs in case you need to move. Your body is getting ready to act in whatever way it needs to to keep itself alive. Um, it's not a pleasant experience. Most people feel very stressed. Some will say their hands are even shaking. And I say, yep, your limbs are really ready to, to support you if you need to make a decision. What, um, what's going on there though is that your brain is is telling your body, we're gonna stay alive. We're gonna make a, make a quick second decision about how to, how to move. What does not happen is your body doesn't go through, your brain doesn't go through a process of, let's say, making a pro and con list, right? Should I step on the brake? Or should I, should I blare on the horn? Or should I swerve? You don't go through that, right? You make a decision that you don't, you're not even aware of because you're keeping yourself alive. Um, those hormones are making that happen, right? It would not have made sense evolutionarily when the tiger was running at the cave for us to sit down and think through long term. I wonder what would happen if the tiger came at me. What would I do? Would I hide behind the rock? You're just going to act, right? And so those are the hormones that are making that happen. Norepinephrine is the main one. Um, for us as adults, what is interesting is that if you think about an experience that you've had like that, we've all had them happen to us, um, people will say they feel jittery, they don't, they don't feel good um, for, for a little while. For the average adult, it takes about five or 10 minutes for your body to reabsorb those, 
those hormones after the after the event is over. So after you decide to slam on the brakes and you realize you're not going to crash, about 10 minutes later your body has reabsorbed those hormones. So you might feel a little shaky, some people will say a little longer. That's on average. What's different about kids, and this is what becomes really critical, those stress hormones will stay in the teenage brain for upwards of an hour or two. So kids are that shaky feeling that they're having, that you're having after the car incident. Kids are going through that for hours. Their brains are not are not acting the same way that we would think w that we would that we would as adults. Um, and why does that matter? Because the other thing that norepinephrine does right, to our bodies is it not only says don't think about the pro and con list. It actually won't let you think. It shuts down the prefrontal cortex ability to think because it doesn't want you to do that, right? It wants you to make the split second decision and keep yourself alive. But now imagine, let's put ourselves in the place of a teenager who is walking to school and maybe is in an unsafe neighborhood. And on the way to school, fears, maybe rationally, um, because of some community violence in their community, that they might be the victim of some sort of assault. And that person goes into that place of thinking that they are unsafe. Norepinephrine floods their brain, they make a decision, they get themselves to school, now they're in first period, they're in algebra, those hormones are still there. That jittery feeling that adults feel is still running through that young person's brain. And um, we certainly hope, but what if then they run into a kid who's been a bully in their school, right, and has caused problems for them? Or if they find out when they get there, there's been an, um, you know, an emotional break with a kid they care about, right? They get, they're dumped, right? This matters. These things, that there's some of the same stuff is going on. Kids can experience repeated incidents where their, their limbic system, system kicks into gear and it takes hours for them to come back to calm, right? Um, so kids who are in the school setting and they get upset and they get agitated and they flip a school table, right? One of the most important things that they need is time. Time and safe space to know they're safe and they're fine and calm and, and ha let their body re-regulate themselves. So um, we know kids are not good at thinking at that moment. And unfortunately, what many well-meaning adults like myself as the silly, stupid, young public defender, um, would ask them, we actually ask them to do the opposite, right? We, ta we try to talk them down from it, right? And we say, you seem really upset, Johnny. Let me explain to you all the reasons why you shouldn't be upset or all the reasons why flipping the table is not a good idea. While he, he, she, whoever is still in that agitated place, they might not look like it to you and me, but you couldn't tell by looking at me that I was agitated in my car when I thought I was about to be crashed into. So it's not something that's visual on the surface, but their behaviors are indicating they need time and space and we need to figure out how, how do we build that um, and still obviously get, get to the important learning that needs to happen in the classroom. Uh, so for, for kids, um, what we also know is that those who have experienced repeated trauma that their systems get exhausted, right? And so we talk about, you know, PTSD-like symptoms that, that kids might experience. Um, they're not going to be good at calming down, and that they will stay potentially at a hypersensitive place and a highly elevated place for a longer period of time than kids do. And we now know. Um, the neurologists have been studying this, that kids who experience repeated trauma, it actually changes the neurons in the brain. They start to look different. And I'd show you a picture of one, but it wouldn't be all that helpful. Um, they look different than healthy neurons. And so we're now trying to figure out how do we build in safety for our kids such that they can have as normal development as, as they should and as they're all do. So when we know about trauma, then, how, then I want to pivot back a little bit to the juvenile justice system, right? Because we have a um, uh, system in America and certainly a system in Massachusetts where young people can come into custody. And by custody, I mean locked settings that they cannot leave um, in, the, in the juvenile justice system. And what do we know about those kids? So there's a national survey. Um, nearly 7,000 young people complete it, and they ask a lot of questions of kids about their experiences and um, what they have gone through. So we see kids that have had very high rates of both trauma and, and emotional dysregulation at different points in their lives. So they will self-report. Um, 45% have a hard time paying attention um, in either school or work. 14% have seen things that other people say are not there. 68% um, say that they are. They feel that they are really easy to upset. Um, so they are recognizing their, their own dysregulation at times. Lindsay, um, quick question. 
Um, some one of the people in the audience asked, um, and I think she's. This is. I'll read the the question. Mm -hmm. But there are successful de-escalation techniques that will help kids to come down from that heightened, out of control place, right? Yes. Yes. So I'm not sure. What, yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> I think time I is think the best. Time. Time. Time, <laughs> time is our our best friend yeah. here. And so for kids, what we know is that. Um, absolutely providing them a safe space, right? Yes. Avoiding re-triggering them. And so if you think about a young person, the young person who's upset, who flips the, flips the table, there are adults in all school communities who are really good at this, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and, and who aren't gonna walk into the room and re-agitate the situation or, or, or pile on, so to speak. Um, but we also know it is going to take time mm -hmm. for those hormones to kind of get yes. re reabsorbed back into that young person's body. And while some kids are different, um, that's, that's probably the most important protective factor what we'll see in school settings is is um, spaces and places that that are safe for kids um, that they can choose to go to and I'm I'm not a fan I'm not I wouldn't advocate that they must go but that, that are designed to help kids re-regulate themselves and, and take a little space and so it might come to pass that the young person you know that something they have done does require some form of discipline in a school setting and I'm not advocating that 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 should never be the case but that moment in time is not also right then and there, right? To bring in the assistant principal and say, "Here's what's going to happen to you now," mm -hmm. while a kid is still in a in a in a place where they're not able to really process and understand and acknowledge their behaviors, mm -hmm. or certainly get into a conversation about how they should have behaved differently. Right. And I think one of the things that I'm going to advocate for for this audience is that um, if it comes to de-escalation, you're too late. Mm -hmm. uh, it needs to be more proactive than that so that the situations don't arise. Right. These kids are, by and large, the kids that are that are at risk of coming into the juvenile justice system have been identified long before yes. their first arrest. Yeah. Um, and so what is it that we've put in place to wrap them and support them while they're going through what, whatever it is they're going through to make sure that school environments mm -hmm. are, are safe and good places? Yeah. Um, so I hope that helped to answer the, que and answer the question. Um, uh, just continuing on just a, a little bit, uh, a couple of these, and folks folks can read the slide, but 70% of young people um, have had something very bad or terrifying happen to them in their life, and 67% have seen someone severely injured or killed, and that's actually in person, not in, on some media. Um, and you get down to the bottom one, and 22% of kids in custody have previously tried to kill themselves. I mean, the, the overlay between our mental health needs for kids um, and the juvenile justice system is readily apparent on its face from some, some of this, this data. Um, there, certainly when we think about actual prior physical abuse, we have 25% um, of kids, again, this is nationally, uh, report prior physical abuse by a caregiver and 12% um, report prior sexual abuse by an adult. We would note that certainly there's a higher rate for females. In fact, only 46% of females report no past physical abuse. So over 50% of girls in the justice system have been um, previously physically or sexually abused. And that's by self-report. By self-report. So it's probably much higher. Yeah, yeah. We <laughs> uh, and self-report while you're in custody, right? right? So it's not. <laughs> um, but uh, as a baseline, what what does that mean when we think about and turn back to kids in Massachusetts? That we know that in our juvenile justice programs and in detention centers um, are around Massachusetts or detention programs, that we have kids who are not good at executive decision making, right? They're not using their frontal lobes, um, and some of them have, have had lots of, of trauma that may have maybe part of that. They have very high rates of mental health hist history and, and involvement in, in both treatment um, and, and hospitalization level care, all, all of that. Lots of traumatic experience. DYS now trains its staff to assume all young people that come into our care um, have been traumatized and are working to make our agency more trauma-informed. So that's a high and, and, and difficult bar to, to meet, an important one for us to work towards. And that they're coming often from challenging school settings. And by that, I don't mean just the buildings themselves, but that they have been struggling in school. I'll have some data I'll share in a little bit about what do we know about their educational outcomes. And school has not always been a great place uh, for kids who are in, in the justice system. Um, and uh, lastly, we know that kids who have been in um, in the justice system are using substances at a higher rate than those who are also in the in the community. So lots of things have been going on. But what I think about all of those, I think of those as very high need, right? Young people with lots and lots of need. Um, thankfully, they are not also engaging in high risk 
um, delinquency behavior. So by that, I mean they're not out there committing armed masked robberies, right? They're not all running around with guns and knives. They are engaging in delinquencies that are, I would frame as typical, right? They're disturbing and disorderly, <laughs> and they're where they're not supposed to be with trespassing, and they're maybe engaging in some lower level assaultive behaviors, but they're not the kids that when we sit around a table and we talk about them that we're all collectively afraid of. Um, they're often kids that we're frustrated with or we're mad at, which is unfortunate because they're not listening to the rules, um, but they're the kids whose needs haven't been met yet in the community. So just to um, put, a, put a little bit of a different frame on this, we know that when kids come into detention, and just to be clear, detention is, is the place where kids come while their court cases are waiting, right? They're, so they have another court case, they may have a cash bail in Massachusetts, they may not, where the young person isn't gonna be released to a parent or guardian or go home, they're gonna stay at DYS until their next court date. And then at the next court date, we're gonna see, are they gonna stay with us again till the next court date? And this could go on for months for many young people. For some, it's, it's much shorter. Um, our average length of stay is 28 days. So on average, kids are staying a month in detention. And what we know nationally is that a detention setting for a young person um, can be an incredibly traumatic experience, particularly for a low-risk young person for whom there isn't the, the, the balance doesn't weigh in favor of keeping the community safe, right? He was not the kid running around with a loaded gun that I'm talking about, but the kid who is a trespassing runaway young person who ends up in the detention system because we just can't get them to stay put. Um, and what we know detention does to those lo low risk kids is that it absolutely exacerbates mental health issues. We have lots of calls to crisis within our own facility where they're coming to screen our, our young people. We know that self-harming behaviors will increase in detention and it doesn't surprise me. <laughs> and detention's not where anyone wants to go or, or be. But we also know when we look long term that young people have significantly reduced educational success. They're much less likely to re-engage in school, or if they do re-engage in school, to stay engaged in school. I want to just spend a moment thinking about that. So um, people will respond to me and they'll say, but Lindsay, you know, you have, you have schools in detention, right? You make them go to school. And I say, we absolutely do. Yes, we provide your, your mandatory schooling and in conjunction with SEIS, your special ed needs can, can get met. Um, However, it's not your typical school setting by any by any stretch. So a detention program will have different kids coming in and out every day. Um, uh, classroom sizes are small, but you could have eight or nine kids who are at different grade levels um, and with different needs all in one building. And then I think about why is it such that so many kids who've been involved in the justice system after that experience school failure or, or school separation. And I just have to put myself in the shoes of a 15 year old who spent a month in detention and who then has to go back to their high school. Well, let's just assume they were in a traditional high school. Um, and they have to, in homeroom, explain where they were for the last month. And then in first period, explain why weren't you here for the last month. And then in second period, and then in third period. And there is a perception that young people carry a lot of bravado um, about being involved in the justice system. That's not been my personal experience. If anything, there's a lot of shame attached to that. And having to admit that there's a reason you missed the history exam was because you were in jail, um, I think is an incredibly sad place for kids and it's easier for them to just walk away. Um, and so we have, there's lots of different things. I think there's things we could do as a system to make it easier for kids to reconnect, but I understand how kids could want to pull back from that. Um, we also know that long-term kids who have been involved in the detention system or come into detention are much less likely to be employed gainfully, um, and they they don't make as stable um, earnings throughout the course of their life, which then perpetuates a continuing cycle, right? If you can't make reasonable money and you can't finish high school, you're more likely to engage in crime, you're more likely to be involved in the adult justice system, and potentially more likely to be involved in the child welfare system, but this time as the parent in the in the future setting. So how do we break that cycle? And uh, the frame that I look at in my work is really focused on detention and saying if we could keep kids out of at least this, this one spot where we know kids can really get set off on a different trajectory, then maybe we have some hope of, of breaking those cycles. I cannot help myself but and put this slide in every time I talk to people <laughs> um, because there is a perception that we should just be more tough on kids. Um, and if we were just, if we just got it through to them, how bad their behaviors are that they would then change. And so scared straight programs um, have been around for decades and um, look everything like 
taking young people into adult facilities and showing them the horrors of their of the consequences of their if they keep engaging in, in delinquent behavior, um, to people coming to talk to kids about their experiences, maybe not in such a scary environment, but again, trying to make them fearful of the, uh, of the future. Um, every study that has looked at this, and there have been many now, have found not only that scared straight doesn't work, but it makes kids more likely to engage in delinquency. So what is that? Let's unpack that for a minute, right? And I think there's a, a couple of different things going on. Um, I think that we message to kids every day what we expect of them um, and they will rise to those expectations and when we expect of them to engage in delinquency and crime we have told that young person you belong in an institution that's how we perceive you and they're going to own that um, scientists would talk about it as labeling theory that's my label you think i'm dangerous you think i guess i'll be that kid i could be that kid um, just as easily as we could label them or channel them onto a path that says you know what we're going to do instead of a scared straight program put all the kids on a bus and drive them to Cambridge, right? And show them the, the um, brick and ivy, not the cinder block and razor wire, and say, this is your future. How are we gonna help, help you get there? Um, but we also know scared straight doesn't work because what we know about the brain science, right? The idea is that we're trying to scare them out of the future behaviors. But we know they're no good at thinking about the future, right? So it doesn't work in that frame either. Um, so uh, for those who um, want to go that route, um, I, I offer that it's, it's not the model that we're seeking and instead we're trying to figure out what are the positives that we could put in kids' lives to encourage them to engage um, in the more pro-social behaviors that we want them to engage in. What's beautiful about the juvenile justice system <laughs> is that thankfully kids grow up um, and, uh, and they're gonna age out, of, uh, age out of crime. So what this slide shows is um, young people over time, and this is arrest rates from the, from the FBI, the only peak we see in offending throughout the life course is during the ages of 13 to about 20 fits pretty clearly with what I was talking about with the brain, right? So you start to engage in risky behaviors around 12 and 13, um, and then right around 16, 17 is when we see that turn, right? Now your frontal lobe starting to develop, and hmm, maybe it doesn't make as much sense for me to continue to shoplift. Maybe it's not a good idea to drive cars at a million miles an hour, right? There is a reason why the actuaries, when you think about renting cars, won't let you rent a car until you're 25, right? Because they've looked at this same stuff and say 25 is about when it starts to, the, we weigh the pros and cons and that starts to make sense for them. Um, so what I think about this though is that is that there is a there is a great hope here. Yes, kids are going to engage in in crime. Um, yes, we don't like it. We want to keep communities and, and the public safe. We want kids to be safe. But we also know that the vast majority of these young people are going to grow out of that behavior. Um, and unfortunately for us, predicting which ones aren't is really hard. Um, and so so hard that we don't we don't have that down at all as a, as a science and so even we as we've made assumptions that have been tested and we found not to be true so people assume the more serious criminals the ones who engage in more serious crime oh they're the ones who are going to go on and engage in future crime we've actually that that has not been borne out um, and so even kids charged with really serious offenses could very easily be amongst the pool that are never gonna offend again um, but uh, we have a great opportunity here and my fear is that during the period of time where kids are engaging in crime that we don't put policies and practices in place that make it more likely that they're going to engage in crime in the future so for us in Massachusetts, um, our detention population is still predominantly comprised of lower level offenders or those who have technical violations of probation. And so that what that would mean is um, they have been put on probation. Probation is a way to be supervised in the community and avoid going to an incarcerated setting big partners of ours at the Massachusetts Probation Service, but that kids then aren't following the rules, right? Um, so they were told you not to smoke marijuana, and you did, right? They told you to go to school every day, and you didn't. Um, and they're not necessarily engaging in new criminal offenses, but they are, they're the rule breakers, mm -hmm. right? And they're chronically rule breaking, and so this goes back to, are we mad at them or are we scared of them? We're mad at them um, and frustrated, and they're very frustrating <laughs> uh, population. So, when we look for us, for just to give you some sense, 53% of all the kids who were detained in the last fiscal year were held on, on low-level offenses um, when they came into the Department of Youth Services. So that's a, we have a, a lot of work to do. How, the, how we do this work, how we, so we structure and, and organize ourselves, is to think about um, um, 
a model that's been proposed and that we've adopted through the Annie E. Casey Foundation called the Juvenile Detention Alternative Initiative. It's a mouthful. JDAI <laughs> is our framework for reforming the system. And I think there's really two pieces that are key to this. One is its collaboration, that we need schools and police and prosecutors and judges and DYS and DCF and DMH, and it continues, it continues all at the table if we're going to change this system because we alone cannot do it you alone cannot do it we need to come together um, so we have on the county level in our six largest counties in massachusetts collaborative groups that get together every month that say what's happening in new bedford and how are we going to do things different and what about lowell and what about worcester and they're trying to work through those and you're all invited um and um that fundamentally what we're trying to get to is a place where each young person that came into the juvenile justice system, that we are assured that we have the right youth and we have them in the right place and we have them there for the right reason, right? So that does mean that kids who commit serious offenses are gonna come into detention and are going to be there for a while. That's okay, It's that's not the kids I'm as, as concerned about as the kids, that trespasser runaway young person who comes into detention and because we can't find a next place for them or because you know, no one's responded to the packets that were sent out for the next residential place for them to go to. They languish in the detention system right alongside of our kid with a serious, serious offense. We do this work through um, eight core strategies. Really at the center of that is, is collaborating, but we were very intentional about the racial and ethnic disparities that exist and persist in our in our system and trying to be a, um, mindful of how to change those. We want to build up alternatives that are in the community so a judge wouldn't have to detain a young person if only they had a fill the blank. What is it, what is it that they need and that we work collaboratively to, to figure that out. We want to think about um, how cases process in the juvenile courts. Are there delays or lags that are keeping kids in the system longer than they need to that are really about the adults, but they aren't about the kid, right? If, the, if every time a kid wants a jury trial, their case has to move to another courthouse and a new prosecutor is assigned and there's a month lag time, that kid's just sitting in detention and has nothing to do with their behavior. Um, uh, moving on to thinking about what are our special populations of young people? So everything from what about um, young girls in the justice system? We're seeing more of them, what's going on there, to what about the needs of LGBTQ kids um, who are overrepresented in the justice system as, as we know? How are we attending to them? How are we supporting them and building up appropriate alternatives? Um, we want to think about objective screening for kids, and those are a way to reduce bias so that no decision maker has a completely unfettered discretion, but instead we can help to structure decisions all throughout the continuum. So everything from um, schools that have looked at discipline policies that have some structure into what kind of discipline can be meted out, and, and it's not just that because you swore at somebody one day, we can be out of school for a really extended length of time, but that we have a measured response right on through to how do judges decide which kid should be detained and which kid is actually a failure to appear at court. Um, um, we have four major goals um, in JDAI uh, right now in Massachusetts. We want to reduce the entry of low-risk kids into the justice system. We want to identify ways to move them out quicker. It's goal two, um, figuring out, what, again, those adults in the decision-making, the decision -making, how, how do we change our process. We want to attend and really respond and attack the disparities that, that exist. And then we want to figure out how do we replicate our work into more places and have greater, greater fidelity. So just to give a couple of quick snapshots, and then I do want to get to the education data for kids. And I had lots I wanted to share with you all today. DCF involved young people. We know Massachusetts is um, unfortunately not doing well comparatively on this issue where we have a greater percentage of child welfare kids in the juvenile justice system. So this is at the point of a detention admission what percentage of young people had an open case with DCF at that day. So somebody in the department, as I would say, knows their name, right? They have a CRA case open or a voluntary case or a child or a protective case. And so you can see across the counties we're running anywhere between 30 to 50 percent. Um, our statewide average right now is 40 percent of all the kids in detention have an open case. And so um, we know there's a lot of work to do there to help make sure those kids, and what a tragic outcome of the child welfare system that a young person who's already been abused or neglected ends up um, now in the juvenile justice system. Um, we also want to be thoughtful about, for this goal too, lengths of stay. Um, the green bars are our most recent fiscal year. Kids are staying longer and longer in detention, and we're trying to figure out why. 
Um, so while our overall detention numbers have been going down the last few years, kids are staying longer and longer and longer um, to the point that DYS is thinking about opening new facilities, which is not the place that we want to be. But um, kids, need, if they're going to stay, we have to have a, a place to put them. So this is an area where we are working in partnership with the administrative office of the juvenile court and the probation department to understand what is going on and, and why is this why is this happening. Lindsay, can I just um, ask a question um, I, the, that's disturbing to me that they're staying longer? Mm -hmm. um, but we had a case recently where um, a kid, a dual status kid, a kid that was in DCF, mm -hmm. went into um, detention center. Um, no one posted his bail because mm -hmm. he didn't have parents that could do that. Yes. Um, and there was no place for him to go because DCF is so booked up in their placements. Is that yeah. possibly one of the reasons? So, what we um, yes, it's, it's one of the complicating factors. Okay. We know we know it, and so child welfare, young people. Um, we while we don't on when we just pull out the child welfare kids, they stay um, only one day longer on average okay. than not child welfare kids. But certainly their problems are different. Child welfare kids also tend to come into our system on less serious offenses across the mm -hmm. board than all other kids, and so they're staying the same amount of time, but their offenses are less serious, yes. right? So, um, and absolutely, we have a lot of young people who have a cash bail. Um, um, the de Department of Children and Families is not going to will not yes. post a bail for yes. a young person, um, but judges will often say, "But we we could release him to a placement mm -hmm. once you find a placement." And so then you're in the battle of finding a placement, yes. and detention is the waiting place yes. where he's where yeah. he or she might reside until that happens. And while um, Department of Children and Families is absolutely our partner in this work, it is an it is a struggle, and we know that their t system is taxed right now, mm -hmm. um, particularly places for. Um, the adolescents yes. uh, and finding the right places for adolescents but it's also a point in time I think for us as a community to really think about but what are the risks right so everyone wants a place for a kid yes. and they and they often when they are saying that they want a safe place for a kid they're thinking uh, I think but if we dig behind that they're thinking about a residential place for mm -hmm. a kid uh, and I would push back that most of these young people I don't think I'll need a residential yes. place right that what we really are what we really should be talking about is how are we going to support that kid in the community at home and with their family because yeah. um, the thing that we know about kids in the justice system um, if we can engage their families early and more often and do a better job with that kids are less likely to recidivate and yeah. isn't that what it's kind of all about yeah. and it's the one place they're going home to no matter how long we keep them away from that parent mm -hmm. that we might think is 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 struggling that's where they're going back to when they're first released mm -hmm. so so how do we as a community build build up those families so kids aren't now, some of those kids do need a, a deep end residential mm -hmm. placement. I'm not saying that, but but I think it's also our perceptions as adults in the system about what are, what are we placing on mm -hmm. uh, on the kids that come come yeah. come through us. Thank you. Um, so uh, this one is particularly disturbing and takes a minute. So let me just explain it. Our this is our detention admissions over the last few years. I think we've lost seven, eight years on here. Um, nine years, nine years on there. <laughs> and um, it's our detention admissions by race and ethnicity. So overall, you see everything's trending down. Detention has been going down, and I, I'm very, very proud of that. Right? We're not using that system as often. Crime has been going down. I think that's a major driver here. Um, but what we are seeing is that the reductions have not been equally borne by all communities. And so young people of color, particularly black and Hispanic young people, um, now make up a greater percentage of the detention population. So if you look at 2007, right, white youth were making up the, had the, were the largest group of young people that were detained. Um, and now that's been sort of inverted. And now it's Hispanic young people are more likely. So overall, when we look at the declines, white youth, that's the, um, the thin blue line, they've declined, their trend line declined by 60, almost 69% over those nine years, whereas Hispanic youth have only declined by 26%. So if your declines aren't equal, over time, you're making up a bigger and bigger percentage. And so while detention has gone down, our disparity has gone up in detention. And that's troubling and needs a lot more attention. I think we have a lot of focus right now um, in the juvenile justice system on, on addressing this. For those who are interested on our website, we've produced a documentary video called Seeing Red, um, which has a lot of our system leaders talking about these issues and some of the national strategies that we need to put in place. But there's, um, we've got to roll up our sleeves and really get to work if we're going to make a difference here. 
I'd like to spend the last maybe 10 minutes or so just talking a bit about what do we know are some of the educational challenges for kids that, that do come into our system. So. Um, in partnership with um, the Collaborative for Educational Services and the Comprehensive Education Partnership, which jointly provide educational services in, in detention through um, contract with the Department of Youth Services, uh, it's a rough place to be a teacher, right? So we have wonderful people, I don't, uh, but they're, they have a challenging job, right? You have kids of certainly different races and ethnicities and languages and cultures and economics but also learning styles and backgrounds and special needs and emotional styles and you're doing it in a secure setting where we also have staff there who are concerned at times that young people might act out more aggressively so it is a, it is it is a rough place to work um, and 50 percent of our kids have a special ed um, identified special need so i think a statewide average last time i looked was somewhere between 14 and 16 percent, so way overrepresented on, on special education needs um, in, in our facilities. Um, for kids who come into DYS, um, uh, people often ask if you are working with a young person and they were to come into DYS, do you get credit? So DYS produces a transcript if young people are in our facilities for more than 10 days. If it's less than that, we produce a certificate of attendance um, as, as the common source. We're always happy to work with schools, but that's sort of what's the standard. We have kids who come in for one day or two and then leave, in which case we're just playing catch up on trying to figure out what grade are you in and <laughs> where should you be? So um, it is not an easy place to work. Out of, um, we had 2,000 kids come into detention, and this, this slide breaks up um, our kids. Now this is the 2,000 kids that came into detention. 1,483 of them were in detention for um, longer than 10 days. So 10 days is a line, I think we've maybe even pushed it down back to seven, but where DYS, we do a dump, essentially, <laughs> data dump, it's lovely, um, <laughs> with the um, uh, DESI, um, Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, and to get kids a basic sort of snapshot or profile about, about kids, because a kid could walk in one day and we know he has a bail minimus that says he's going to be with us for seven days, and we're scrambling trying to figure out what school is he in, where is he at, is he an English language learner, what, what, you know, all of those different things to think about. So we get information back from um, Desi, and then um, we've included in this snapshot all of the kids for which we got that information back. So if you're only with us for a couple of days, you're not included. But this shows you the number of times kids are cycling in and out of our system. So for those 1,483 kids, um, um, about a thousand of them came in once. 283 of them came into the detention system twice. 91 of them came in three times over the course of one of one year. So we know our kids are cycling, and maybe when they're not doing well in the community, they're coming back in, they're going back out, and coming back in. Um, um, so I'd already said our average length of stay in, in, in this sample um, was uh, 24 days with a median of 14 days. So we're just thinking about for the, our educators who are trying to, trying to work with these kids. But our range goes from one to 300 days. So we have a kid, you know, or two kids who are gonna be with us for nearly a whole, a whole school year. When we look at the age changes, so we did a poll on this in 2015, and then we did a, we compared it to a very similar uh, data poll that we done in 2013. So two years later, what are what are we seeing? We're seeing that our population is getting older, um, which makes sense. Some of you who are familiar with the, with justice system reforms in 2013, um, the juvenile court changed their jurisdictional age from 17 to 18, and so if you had previously were a 17 year old charged with a crime you went to a county house of correction and you were charged in the adult court. We were very supportive of that change. It did, though, change the population. So we're seeing kids who are a little bit older. So now those 17-year-olds are in the juvenile court and therefore would come to DYS and get some of the protections that come with the juvenile court. Um, but certainly then we're seeing kids get a little, a little bit older. Um, about 20% of our young people are female. Um, in the juvenile court, it's about 25%, and so we know um, girls are a little less likely to be detained than, than boys are. And then our grade levels, um, again, somewhat, somewhat, we saw a change in age. We don't see a major change, though, in grade level. Our kids are historically behind uh, grades, so whatever grade they should be, they're usually at least one year behind by age. Um, and so uh, while we have mostly 17-year-olds, we see, you see we, we have largely ninth graders, for instance. Um, and so with the, those don't match up in the traditional courses we would like. When we get to special education, um, we have um, um, 
50% of all of our kids, as I already said, almost 51% have a special education need um, and are already identified. Many people will say, what about those who aren't identified? We will start that process in detention if, if we notice an issue, but these are this is the data for kids who are coming in already on an education plan. And when we think about their disability, the vast majority of them, um, their primary disability is an emotional disability. Um, but you'll see many others in their specific learning and et cetera on down. When um, we think of those who are English language learner, a little, little mess up on that slide there, 12% of them are English language learners. Um, and so again, just thinking about it, how how do we figure out how to ed meet the educational needs of a young person who's only with us for such a short period of time and might be coming in with um, language needs that are particularly also when they're non-traditional. The assumption often is that the kids in the justice system are also the ones that are making the schoolhouses run amok, right? And, uh, and they're, they're a big challenge there. That's true for about half of them. <laughs> and half of them really aren't presenting with school problems. So 54% of the kids in the last school year did not have a suspension. Uh, so they were in their schools in a traditional set setting. The other half of them are struggling, right? And so you'll see they had either only one in-school suspension, more than one in-school, one out of school, or more than one out of school suspension. And so, so while half of them had no suspensions, 30, about 32% of them had multiple out of school suspensions. That kind of um, mirrors the whole idea of the status offenses, the, the ones that are doing the low, the low level offenses, yeah. right? Yes. Yeah, and it just, I think, also <coughs> reflects that juvenile justice kids don't always present with challenges in all ways, in right. all places, yeah. right? And so they might have challenges in their home setting mm -hmm. or in their residential placement, but they're not necessarily acting out in school. Mm -hmm. So maybe that's about who's in those schools and we have good people that can keep those kids safe mm -hmm. and, and doing well. Um, that data did come from um, the Collaborative for Educational Services, so you have some of their contact information there. I think when we get to thinking about what is it that you can do, first of all, you can, um, come to any local, we have a lot of statewide JDAI meetings, learn more about JDAI, learn about the um, how you can play a role in reforming the justice system, because I am sincere when I say it is not something that we can do alone, and we need many more voices, and particularly community voices at the table, to push on us and to tell us in the system what we need to fix. Um, I think you can also, though, um, engage your local stakeholders in thinking about what are the diversionary options for kids. Um, just because kids might be misbehaving in one setting doesn't mean they need to they, they need to be removed from that setting. But it does need we do we do firmly believe in accountability. To us, accountability though is not the same as punishment. And so, how do we hold young people accountable for their behaviors in diff in different settings and in, and in different ways? Um, the other one for me really simply is, is to make yourself a teaching tool, right? That the juvenile justice system is not the solution for all of the other ills that are happening for these kids, right? The kid with lots of trauma and a child welfare involvement and he's a struggle in school. The juvenile justice system is not a fix on those. Um, and if we reserved it for just those kids that we are scared of, we would, we would also have much better outcomes in, in our system. Um, and, and we, I would strongly encourage you, if you are involved with a young person who, is, who does come into the juvenile justice system, advocate for them just as hard as you would before, right? They'd hold us to account um, and, and our partners in, in the Department of Youth Services and at SEIS, and we want to hear from folks and make sure that we're doing the best that we can for kids. So a simple one, if you know a kid who's coming into detention, send us the IEP. We're not going to get it right away. We're going to have to do an information request to the school to get it back. If you have a copy of it in your file because you're an advocate working with a kid, we'll then make sure those needs can get met that much more quickly. Is that legal with confidence with FERPA? To share, we we are we become the school placement. Okay, all right. So it'll be like yeah. sharing with the school. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. And so we're doing that work in conjunction with the the local educational agency maintains its responsibility, but we're now the school okay. placement. So we can do a record request to the school, yes. and yes. they have so. to comply to that. Like okay. he'd been transferred to a new school. The fact is, it just doesn't happen automatically. Right. Um, right. There are many reasons for that too. Just so everyone knows, some schools will discipline kids for their involvement in the juvenile justice system. So we yeah. are. So if you've been charged with a felony offense and your school doesn't know that they can move to try to keep you out of the school setting so there's reasons that DYS has been slow mm -hmm. to make things automatic for some of our kids um, this is our contact information that's our, our website is mass.gov backslash JDAI I would strongly encourage you check it out we have a lot up there um, but you also can feel free to reach out to me with any questions or thoughts about how mm -hmm. to get involved
Okay, so thank you so much, yes. Lindsay. I, we do have a couple of questions, um, and I don't. We're we're running short on time. <laughs> um, I don't know whether you have somewhere to be right away. I'm good. Okay, so <laughs> if you do want to stay online and and ask us some questions, please feel free to type them in. Um, one of them that came through was actually from some someone who works at DCF. Okay. Um, and they he wondered if there um, are new programs, uh, new or expanded supportive services because for the low level offenders, because he says that they struggle with placements um, and the availability of services, um, yeah. which we had spoken about. Yeah, so, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And, and certainly these conversations run up and down through w between DCF and yes. DYS at the commissioner level and right on mm -hmm. down to on the individual yeah. kid and I don't want to in any way pretend that it is an easy solution but I was just moments uh, ago earlier this morning with um, um, Massachusetts major city chiefs talking with the police chiefs about what relationships and partnerships have they made with other community service agencies in order to keep those low-risk kids from ever entering our system mm -hmm. so so this does become very much a local solution um, and so when we think about schools and police are really our two most local of agencies yes. right run by yeah. school boards and and, and town governments government um, it is incumbent on all of us to to be a, a very much a squeaky wheel there mm -hmm. and to say what are you doing so we have org we have wonderful communities there's lots of them that have done lots of different things so organizations small towns that have partnered in their youth and family services with their police departments right so that when a police department identifies a young person that town youth and family services not all towns have them many do are able to connect that young person up um, one of the pieces that I encourage police officers to do is have they visited their family resource center most of them look at me blankly <laughs> <laughs> and then I say here's what they are uh, and here's where you can find them and so those connections on the local level are not happening at, at the rate at which we mm -hmm. see the need for them um, and it's one of the places that I'm often encouraging folks to say and 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 service agencies change right so that makes mm -hmm. it a challenge mm -hmm. that that there's a revolving door of you got a grant you opened a great program you lost your grant your program closed um, but all the more why we need everyone in the room to go hey there's a new grant and there's a new program and that's going to serve some of our needs and if that one is proving effective hopefully as a community we can figure out how to keep it going so I'm not sure that's a perfect answer to the to the question but there are many new things happening um, and I think it's just a matter of, it's not just a matter, we always could use more money and, and more things for kids, right? Uh, um, but a big piece of this that is the, the dollar free solution is, is actually that connection. And so when a, when, a, when a police officer or a school adjustment counselor by nature of their work being incredibly busy has no idea of the breadth of services mm -hmm. in a family resource center, what a disservice to their to the young people and families they're trying to work with, mm -hmm. right? So yeah. it's on us to keep pushing them. And it, and it is very local. I know that that yes. every every town or area has different programs, um, and sometimes the schools contribute to those different programs. Absolutely. Um, I know New Bedford had a whole a, a school. I think it still does of kids that were in lockup. Yes. Um, and they would go to this particular school. Mm. So it was, okay. um, it's very interesting the way different places. Yeah. Well, you have to think about from the schools and policing perspective. I joke we have 351 different police departments mm -hmm. to work with and, and then you can add some more for state police and some others and we have 450 different school districts. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of local work uh, yep. that the state can't mandate on them in any particular way yep. and so we I think just have to continue to advocate and to push. There has to be greater local community-based yes. support for most of these kids and those ones that we really can't find that for and then whose needs are so high those are the ones that should come into the juvenile justice system yes um, another question is are the juvenile court judges being trained in these alternatives yes yes uh, great question so the Chief Justice of the Juvenile Court, Amy Nectum, is a big, a strong and loud and vocal support a proponent for JDAI. I was just talking with them recently about how do they train new judges on, mm -hmm. on some of this and some of the philosophy, but they are um, at the table. They're part of our governance committee and our governance structure for how JDAI functions, um, and we are routinely at their conferences trying to sort of push the envelope a little bit on, on some of these things, but also hear from them about the challenges they see and, and you know go back to our service community and say the judges say that if they had this kind of service these kids they wouldn't detain and then it's on us again to go back locally mm -hmm. and figure out how do we meet some of those needs yeah. 
Um, another question is, do you have experience interacting with Communities for Restorative Justice as a possible alternative? Yes, Communities for Restorative Justice is wonderful. Um, yes, great, great partner. So restorative justice is that it could be a solution for so much of this. Yeah. And so how do we think about restorative practices in school settings? How do we infuse that into juvenile justice settings where that's very much non-traditional? Yeah. Um, how do we create diversionary programs that could that could use that opportunity? So Communities for Restorative Justice, you know, based, I believe, still in Newton, but so some of those surrounding communities is, is one option that will take kids as a diversion from the traditional court processing it has had wonderful success. There's a great program out of the Middlesex District Attorney's Office that is a diversion run through the District Attorney's Office, which is great. So more, a little more formalized, a little, a little deeper involved young people, but they're, they again are using restorative justice to engage with kids and keep them out of the system and keep them from having criminal records, which is such a, a, a huge boon in the, in yes. the long term. Okay. Um, uh, and as I understand, Suffolk County DAs is about to launch a restorative justice program mm -hmm. um, as a diversionary program in conjunction with UMass Boston, and they have a Center for Restorative Justice or something like that there. I forget exactly what it's titled. Um, so with that's one of the pl places that I see great progress and hope, and particularly one of the places where when we're engaging with school communities, we think about safe and supportive schools and social and emotional learning for kids. Adolescence is a beautiful time for developing empathy, right? It's actually a great moment and, and to use to figure out how do we teach through this. Mm -hmm. And restorative justice, I think, is one, one one incredibly great potential for us. Okay, and um, one other question that came in actually a little bit earlier, um, probably from one of our uh, special education <laughs> surrogate parents, what curriculum do they teach to um, uh, for, sc for school in, um, in the de detention centers? Do they follow the general curriculum? Yeah, um, common, yeah, yes, that, yes, yes, they okay. do, yes, they do. And so, um, and for those who are interested in some more of that, feel free to reach out to me and I could connect you with our um, Director for Education at, at DYS with some more specific okay. questions. Um, I, I am not an educator and so um, I, played one, I played one <laughs> once and it wasn't good for anyone. Um, and, uh, and so there are others who, could, who we could make sure to get you the right answer okay. for that. Excellent, thank you. Yeah. Um, okay, I, I think we're done um, and I would uh, like to Thank you again, Lindsay. Thank it was you. a great presentation. And um, everybody out there, we'll see you again next month. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Okay. <laughs>